Every day, a new development. Every hour, a new story. Every minute, history in the making. This is TNM News. Hi, everybody. Todd Dankin here with TNM News for yet another Todd Talk. And uh, today, uh, we are talking to some very successful women in the cannabis space and in the Web3 space. Uh, first up, we have Liz Wald, and she started her career at Nike, leading a team that opened the first Nike town and then went to Kellogg to get her MBA in finance and international marketing. Then she built a consulting firm focused on the emerging dot-com industry. Remember that uh, explosion in the mid-90s? Maybe some of you aren't old enough to remember, but I definitely remember. Um, then she sold that business after four years, and she's always been passionate about entrepreneurship. She started her own company with uh, women craftsmakers. She then joined Etsy in its early days and built its global marketplace operations. She then took her Etsy knowledge and developed and led operations for Indiegogo in Europe, Australia, Canada, Israel, and China. Oh, is that all? And with her today is her partner, uh, Polly Lieberman, who uh, spent her career running sales and marketing for technology companies in mobile, digital, advertising, creative services, data, and identity solutions. She was frequently called upon for thought leadership and was routinely recognized as one of the most powerful women in mobile advertising. Polly is passionate about emerging technologies and creating innovative strategies to help brands connect with consumers, the most important thing a brand can do. She has a track record of leading first-to-market programs for Fortune 500 brands like Nike, Ford, Target, Showtime, Bank of America, just to name a few. And Polly has been consulting and advising brands and technology companies in the cannabis industry since 2018, with a focus on fundraising, digital marketing, and revenue acceleration. They've both been drawn to technology and emerging industries, so it's no surprise they became attracted to cannabis and, of course, Web3. Now they're putting their experience of leveraging new technologies and building companies into their new company called Thrice. Thrice is an NFT membership club for people looking to incorporate cannabis into their lives, and membership unlocks access to education, experts, exclusive deals, and experiences. Ladies, welcome to TNM News. Thank you so much for having us, Todd. Of course. Yeah, great to be here. Awesome. Awesome. Great to have you. So we have lots and lots to talk about today, especially in the uh, Web3 space. But uh, before we get to that, I want to know what drew you corporate icons to cannabis. <laughs> well, first and foremost, thank you for um, calling me a corporate icon. <laughs> um, not a corporate wanker. Um, <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> But, you know, my my career that you sort of highlighted and thank you for making me look and sound so good. <laughs> I forgot about the overlap that Liz and I and I have with Nike. Um, but um, I spent the majority of my career in mobile, which was really a nascent market. And at the beginning, believe it or not, you know, the iPhone has has been around for less than 15 years. And think about how quickly our lives have changed based on how we engage with our mobile devices. Long story short, mobile had gone mainstream. I love the evangelical part of building an industry and putting the pieces of the puzzle together and really doing a lot of thought leadership and education. And I was looking for something new, really. And I always was a firm believer, a believer in legalization. And uh, I'm a big skier, so I started to spend a lot of time in Colorado when they legalized and said, this is an interesting market. Let me dig in a little bit more. And as I started to dig in more and more, I realized that there was this tremendous white space in the cannabis industry, which was really for um, people who had strong business backgrounds, who really understood how to build companies in the early, early days of cannabis, which wasn't that long ago. It was very much focused on the agricultural part of the business because fundamentally that's what it is. It's evolved quite a bit since then. Yeah. And the pandemic changed everything, but it really changed cannabis a lot. 
And um, that was my initial attraction was really that I'm a proponent of legalization. I thought that it was an interesting industry. I love emerging markets. And this was sort of an emerging market um, that was very attractive for a lot of reasons. One of the things that I noticed early on was and inspired me to really dig in was how many people working in the industry's lives had been positively impacted by, you know, the power of the plant, which sounds sort of cheeky, but it is so important. And I was so touched by that and doing work that's meaningful was really something that I was drawn to as well. So those two things. Yeah. I've, I've interviewed lots of folks uh, in the cannabis space and, a good 70 to 80 percent of the people who are in the cannabis industry, you're right, have a story. You know, my friend, my cousin, myself, my sister, my mother, somebody uh, got sick and uh, cannabis helped save their lives. So that's interesting that it's uh, it's uh, really uh, in your world, too. And you you were really aware of that. Absolutely. Liz, how did you get attracted to uh, to cannabis? Yeah, you know, similarly to Polly on the idea of spending 25 years in in sort of emerging technology and then thinking like, what's the next thing coming, right? Like what's going to be the next interesting emerging industry? And my career has been very much business to consumer focused, right? Like I've worked on the marketplaces that have connected buyers and sellers, but the end consumer or the end buyer has always been a consumer. And when you think of cannabis, as a product category, like a consumer product good, CPG. I mean, you're talking about everything from, you know, drinks to creams to food to medicine, you know, pharmaceuticals, like it really can touch almost every consumer product category out there. Similarly, the way the internet, you know, touched pretty much every category out there. And so that was very interesting to me, sort of reliving those mid 90s of of what's coming. And, you know, um, you mentioned I went to business school and when I got out in 1995 and my friends were going to Bain and Booz and McKinsey and Goldman and Morgan. And I'm like, hey, the Internet, you know, and, and I and I and people were like, are you crazy? Like I went to AOL when you've got mail, you know, and. Right. And then when I came back from my, you know, reunion five years later, and I started talking about this site called Etsy and people are like, what are you talking about? You know? So, so <laughs> for me, it was like, this is really exciting. And I was also watching this whole, you know, everything coming from the West coast to the East coast. Right. So New York being a massive market for, for everything, but certainly for anything, consumer marketing product brands, you know, I was like, okay, this is going to be huge over here. Um, and, you know, we'll get into the whole Web3 side of things. But really around the same time, blockchain, crypto, Web3 was also sort of emerging. And I thought, OK, these are two topics I need to know something about. And so I just kind of dove in. I was about um, a little earlier to the blockchain side and then got into sort of the cannabis side, sort of 2019-ish. Uh, and here we are today. Right. Right. And uh, do you guys uh, consume cannabis? And if so, um, what's your favorite way to do that? Sure. Um, okay, so this is the order that we'll go in. Um, <laughs> well, I, so uh, probably like a lot of people, I did. I did back in the early days when I was in college, and uh -huh. I, you know, embraced in sort of the more traditional ways. Um, as a as an adult. I'm more interested in to what Liz called consumer packaged goods and really the way that we think about cannabis, uh, love edibles, love, you know, things that I don't have to smoke. I am not a fan of anything that has to do with smoking. In fact, right. I don't smoke at all. Beverages are really interesting. Um, infused food or ways to infuse food is really interesting. So those are kind of the ways that I I consume not super regularly. I would say the most frequent um, way that I consume and the way that I really started within cannabis was topicals because I'm an athlete and I have a lot of, you know, chronic issues yeah. within, <laughs> you know, muscles and blah, 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 blah. Sure. We don't have to talk about that because it's too boring. But I found <laughs> that the creams 
were really helpful yeah. to me. Um, and interestingly enough, introduced them to my dad, who found tremendous benefit for arthritis in his neck and his knees. And, you know, everyone's like, why'd you get into the industry? I'm like, look, they say if you can get your parents consuming cannabis, then you should be working in the biz. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> Uh, yeah, that's great. You know, the, the that's one of the wonderful things about cannabis is that it can be consumed in so many different ways. And uh, I, I believe that eventually over time, as uh, federal legalization happens, you know, it we'll find CBD and some THC in just about every uh, consumer product, don't you think? Definitely. I, it's, it's coming in, in many, many forms. You know, just the the way other products have taken on health and wellness attributes yeah right omega-3s or whatever you know whatever the thing might be of, of the moment but you know i've always had a big passion for craft beer and i even went so far as to try to earn something called a cicerone which is kind of a sommelier of beer um, it's a very difficult pa uh, test to pass apparently more people pass the new york bar than the cicerone exam but um I was close, so close. But I learned a ton about how beer gets its flavors and its smells and it's how you pair it and all those things. And I look at the cannabis industry and I see such a parallel. You know, being a big athlete like Polly, I've never been someone who wanted to smoke, but I really like the social aspect. I like being able to hold, you know, a beverage in my hand and hang out with friends. And that's a very common social interaction that we're yeah. all very used to. And today, you know, when you look at like what White Claw and sort of the spiked seltzer category has done for alcohol, and you pa pair that up to cannabis where you can match terpene flavors with fruits that might be in your club sodas and you have no calories and no hangovers, and you get up the next morning and go skiing or hiking or biking, to me, that's just a tremendous win. And I also like um, some of the formulated edibles that are for specific things. You know, people think, oh, I'm going to like take this edible and just chill on the couch. But you can take it for, you know, for focus or for energy or passion or, or whatever it is. And I think that part of the industry is really interesting. And it isn't all about just like getting, you know, stoned out of your mind. Um, you can it, you can certainly use it for creativity and all those sort of historically known things. But for me, the consumer packaged goods part of it um, is going to be great. And I think it's going to be a good substitute for alcohol. And as much as I enjoy my, you know, beers and cocktails, alcohol is not that good for you. So no, um, it's uh, literally we'll poison. More of that. <laughs> right. It's literally poison. Right. Literally poison, exactly. <laughs> yeah. It's funny, we have similar backgrounds. Uh, I was in the dot-com world uh, for several years and was looking for the next trend. And uh, it was, you know, in uh, early, like, 2000 and uh, late 2008, uh, 2009. And uh, it was all about grow your own. And uh, I got into the cannabis uh, industry that way. So it's it, it's been a minute. So uh, I'm here with uh, Liz Wald and Polly Lieberman from uh, Thrice. Um leaders in the uh, cannabis space and in the Web3 movement. Um, you know, I, I interviewed lots of, uh, you know, CEOs and CFOs and partners and founders in the cannabis space that are women. And women are really thriving in this cannabis space. Why do you think um, that is? And why do you think the fastest growing demographic of new cannabis users are also women? It's a really good question. I mean, I think that your data is accurate, but it's interesting that you brought it up because having spent the majority of my career up until cannabis working in in technology right. and always being in the advantageous position of never having a line at conferences at the ladies restroom, you right. know, which is which is very unusual. Right. And and sat mostly on executive teams for startups as the only woman. Uh, I was very attracted to cannabis because there was such um, a strong showing of women in leadership positions. I think that in the cannabis industry, it's changing a little bit as cannabis gets more funded and cannabis gets more corporate, unfortunately. 
But I think that one, women are innovators and team builders and collaborators. And I've never worked in an industry where there is so much cooperation and so much uh, responsiveness and access to people at super high levels. And I think that that's really attractive to women. And I think that um, every woman founder that I consulted with or one leader that I've worked with um, in this industry basically found one thing very early on in their journey into cannabis was there was nothing there for them. The dispensaries looked like car washes or, you know, uh, you know, men caves, not, not that there's anything wrong with them and the product assortment did not resonate. And now you go into dispensaries and many of them look more like spas or, you know, high-end salons or whatever it is of high-end boutiques. And the products that exist are much more uh, focused or um, interesting and appealing to women. And I think that a lot of businesses, not just in the cannabis industry, but in general are built out of need. And there was such a huge need to represent women, both from the experiences within dispensaries, but also in product assortment, it brought more entrepreneurs in. And, you know, women in general, cannabis is primarily made up of small businesses. And women in general have a much higher percentage of founder or CEO leadership roles in small businesses to begin with. Yeah, that's true. And, uh, and, you know, w women traditionally are nurturers. The plant is a female plant, right? And uh, this really, uh, I, I think it fits perfectly. And I, I love the fact that women are thriving um, in the cannabis space. Uh, I run a lab in uh, Las Vegas, Nevada. We have 19 employees and 15 of them are women. Um, so, it's Yay! <laughs> it's, you know, I just I, I completely agree with everything Polly said. I think one other really interesting thing about this industry is you can enter this industry in hundreds of different ways. Right. You can be a marketer. You could be a, um, a you know, a farmer. You could be right. uh, doing a, a technology Thing. You can do something that's a very different from, hey, the tech industry is booming and everyone came in first as a coder or whatever, right? So right. you can enter the cannabis industry having taken your skills as a lawyer, a marketer, a scientist, what have you, and be like, you know what, I've been doing this for 15, 20 years in my industry I'm going to go start something in this new industry with the skill set I have. And that doesn't come around very often um, in any, you know, sort of, I feel really lucky. I've had like the whole internet.com boom, and now I'm getting the cannabis boom in my lifetime. Some people don't have any of that, right? That's so right. I do think that that is also opened doors that would not have been so easily opened in a more narrow industry. This industry is so broad. And I think the numbers are like, half a million people work in the cannabis industry today and like 70,000 people work in the coal industry. So just right. to like set the perspective on where the industry is going. Right. I always say about the cannabis business, if you, if you remove the sexy word of cannabis, it's business, right? And you need everything you need in every other business that you need in the cannabis business. The difference is it's way highly regulated and you got to follow a lot more rules, but, um, but yeah, it's interesting how, uh, you know, women are definitely thriving in the cannabis space. So now let's talk about uh, Thrice and let's talk about what Thrice is, how you guys met and how you guys came up with the idea for Thrice. Sure. So Liz and I met initially because we are both mentors at an accelerator in New York and we were at one of their startup feature nights and, you know, typically after the presentations were made, there were there was some networking and we were, you know, one of four women or two of four women that were at the event. So, you know, naturally we were talking to everyone and we met each other and then re both realized that we were doing work in the cannabis industry, interestingly enough. And then, you know, our relationship progressed and we collaborated over more and more things 
And we spent one MJ Biz together as roomies and realized how compatible we were and that we were like literally raised in different families. You know, almost everything identical except for I'm a Giants fan and she's a Patriots fan. But like Honey Nut Cheerios was like <laughs> our sweet cereal in both of our households. So, you know, we really just got along very well and share a lot of the same values. And the original idea behind Thrice was built out of a need, which was really the fact that people within our immediate orbit were asking us the same questions over and over and over. Just core information, like basic things, like the CBD get me high to... Uh, I need some cream because I hear it's really good for my muscle cramps. Can you recommend something? Or I'm having trouble sleeping or I'm going to a dispensary in Massachusetts. Where, what should I buy? And this was happening so frequently that we realized that there were three themes that people were, were asking about what, what they should know, where they should go and what products they should try Hence, those three things turned into Thrice, which started out as uh, things to know, places to go, products to try newsletter, and remains a newsletter as the first phase of our launch. And Liz and I really collaborated on this idea, and she she can kind of talk about, I'll pass the baton to her to talk about, you know, how she overlaid the whole web three and nft aspect of the business from that original concept and how we brought it to life so liz do you want to chime yeah, in sure. on so that? you know it's funny it was about this time of year last year where you know i was like polly we need to we need to talk about what is going on in the cannabis world coming to new york what's going on in the technology world and NFTs at the end of last year were certainly having a moment. Like everybody was talking about them. ETH was four thousand dollars a token. You know, it was it was up there. Sure. And you know, we we were like, yes, this is a kind of a trend, and and it's exciting and all of that. But Web three is about owning your own data and having more independence and not being beholden to the big. Web2 companies like Google and Facebook and all of that. And that is definitely in the same vein as anyone in the cannabis industry, right? Like fighting the federal government's like long time, um, you know, in a uh, prohibition of this plant, um, having more independence and all of that. But because of all that prohibition, it's really hard to connect with consumers. It's very hard to market and advertise when Google and Facebook and Instagram and TikTok take down your ads and your site over and over and over and over. You might build up an audience of 100,000 people and it's gone tomorrow because they've just taken it down. So then we started thinking about, well, Web3 is about this direct connection between people and products and people and companies and people and people. Right. And so is there a way that we could use this new technology to connect consumers with brands, with stores, with, um, you know, anything within the industry that's having a hard time getting to them? So that was kind of the impetus of this conversation. And we thought, well, NFTs are definitely coming, you know, in, in, in our opinion, you know, the, the next generation is probably not going to carry around a little piece of plastic in a wallet with a face on it, you that's know, right. that's laminated, right? It's going to be a digital NFT of their driver's license and their high school diploma and their college yeah. diploma and everything else. And so if we could kind of get in here a little bit early and use the technology that's burgeoning now in a fun way and talk to all these people that are going to be like, coming back to or trying cannabis really for the first time since pot brownies, you know, 25 years ago, this could be a, an amazing opportunity. And, you know, it's, it's one of these things where like, when you're really early, you either, you know, you can take some arrows in the back, but you can also kind of build something early that people really resonate with as times are changing. And so we kind of went back and forth and, and decided, you know, let's start something. And so in January, we like filed for our, you know, articles of incorporation and we were on our way. Awesome. 
Awesome. So tell me how Thrice uh, is connecting the cannabis community to the world of Web3. Sure. Uh, well, so basically at the highest level, really, we talked about the two big challenges, right? Consumers want information, but they don't know where to go. They want product recommendations. They don't know who to trust. And then to what really what Liz just covered, the number one challenge that cannabis brands have, number one, every single one is access to customers because of a number of different things. One is, you know, state limitations, federal legalization, and then the fact that, you know, advertising and marketing is super challenging. Yeah. So pre-pandemic, right, you basically had two ways to connect with, with cu customers, at least the way that most cannabis brands were thinking about it, have some type of patient appreciation day, you know, an event at the store, typical CPG, where you would run an event um, and have some people representing, you know, sample, like sampling in the supermarket, same exact type of thing, or at events, actual events. And then during the pandemic, everything changed, right? And people said, wow, we actually need to have a marketing website. We want to let people be, be able to buy from our from our site, we want to, and then all of the e-commerce that we knew was coming eventually in the cannabis industry was here in our regular world, sort of whatever, every other aspect of life we're, we're participating in more and more e-commerce. So uh, there was a, a real uptake in sort of digital in, in general. Um, as it relates to Web3, so your identity is such an important aspect of who you are and how you manage, you know, what everything about your digital life and your real life. And in, we believe that an NFT is a great way to access that. So our membership card is this cool, innovative thing called an NFT. And the interesting thing about NFTs in particular is that it's art, right? So it doesn't have to be art, to be clear. It could right. just say thrice on it, membership card. Yeah. But we um, we have a mission to create better conversations about cannabis. And our larger vision is to normalize cannabis. So the stigma is 100% real. And it still exists. And the yeah. number one thing that we really want to help get across, particularly with the visualization of our brand and our NFTs, is that it's time the cannabis users look like everyone because that's who they are. The they already do, right. They already do look like everyone, yeah. They already do, but they're not being portrayed that way. 100%, that's right. And, you know one of the inspirations for really crafting this NFT that was, that looked like everyone that represented everyone from, we have doctors and lawyers and, you know, business people and you name it, everyone in our collection. And it was in part inspired by, we were doing a piece on 420 and the history of 420. So everyone knew what 420 was, but they didn't really know the meaning of it. So we thought it was important to do a piece on it in our commitment to education and all of the imagery associated with 420 and largely cannabis and cannabis, all cannabis media coverage shows Bob Marley or Willie Nelson or, you know, your typical stoner Cheech and Chong. And that's just not who the cannabis consumer is today. So our NFT and really committing to representing everyone at cannabis users look like everyone. And we call our NFT collection slash our membership card everyday people because that's who cannabis users are. Yeah. And if they, they, they always say, if you could see it, you can be it. So our hope is that you look at our membership card, you look at our collections and you say, Ooh, that looks like me. Oh, this person, I, I mean, obviously they're avatars, right? But they look like 
everyone. And that almost says, oh, this person is a cannabis consumer. This person is a cannabis consumer. So that's what's really we're we hope we're playing a leadership role in that. Um, so that's really the NFT and the art. But the real value is Web3 and all of the mechanisms of Web3 and how people are engaging. So when you think about Web3, it's really the next iteration of the internet. So we're talking about, you know, uh, building a membership that specifically takes advantage of some of the things that are unique to Web3. So using your NFT as your access point to verify your membership, to access a membership benefits area of our site, to access special events that exist both in real life, potentially in the metaverse, potentially we'll be doing like 3D or immersive, it's not even 3D, immersive virtual reality events that are walkthroughs of dispensaries. So people, a lot of people, you asked about women before, a lot of women in particular, but people in general are terrified to go into a dispensary because they have no idea what to expect. Right, right. And people who live in California or other states who, who, who have been going to dispensaries for a long time are you know, more familiar with that experience, but actually using some of the tools in Web3 to connect with consumers through private channels and private ways to engage with our consumers and also give our brand partners access to those consumers is going to be really, really interesting for us. Right. Right. You can know, um can you explain what an NFT membership club is, how it sure. works, how much it costs, and what are the benefits for someone who's a holder of a thrice NFT? Sure. Um, so in in the in the simplest sense, just like any club you join, you pay an initiation fee. In some clubs you have to pay a monthly fee. We don't have that. You you join this club, and once you're a member of the club, it unlocks, as you introduced early um, in this conversation, access to experts, events, experiences, discounts, things that allow us to do the marketing directly, have events and do things you know that you can't really do in the Facebook environment or in the Instagram environment or the like. Um, and you know, people are like, well, why do I have to use an NFT? And it's like, well, there are a couple of things. We're not, you don't you don't really have to understand NFTs, right? Like everybody uses email and everyone uses the internet and everyone drives a car and everyone watches TV. And 99% of people have no idea how their car works, their TV works, how the internet works, why email works. They're not looking at HTTP colon and thinking, oh, that's a protocol, you know, none of that, right? Sure, sure. So what we're saying is, look, cannabis is something really interesting and new and you want to learn about it. But maybe you don't, you're not quite ready to tell your entire Facebook community that that's what you're into right now. So here's a kind of a new fun tool. It's coming anyway. You might as well learn a little bit about it to join this club and feel like it's kind of exclusive. It's kind of cool. Uh, and we're making it super simple. The, the typical NFT project out there, you have to mint an NFT and you don't know what you're going to get. You've got to connect this wallet. You don't know what any of these things mean. And then something shows up and historically it's everything in the cannabis space has looked like Snoop Dogg and a bored ape had a baby and spit out some crazy looking NFT. And so we said, look, we're going to, we are going to mint them. We're going to have you, we're going to say, come to this website, join.thrice.io, and find one you like, click on it. If you don't own any ETH, buy it with a credit card. You know, if you don't have a wallet yet, you don't, don't worry about that. You know, if you do have a wallet, great. If you have a wallet and don't have ETH, also fine. Like, we're going to make it so simple that you're like, oh, this is cool, and I can click on it and... I, I think back so far to like when I was, you know, 25, 30 years old, showing my mother how to use Facebook. And she's like, why would I use this? And then it's like, oh, the grandchildren are there, right? And so we're saying we can unlock cool perks and benefits and events. And, you know, maybe you'll never put on an Oculus, 
but maybe you would like to see this cool tour of a dispensary in 2D on your laptop, you know, kind of thing that we can unlock using this technology. And so we're very much 95% focused on the cannabis side and 5% focused on what the technology is about and more saying, this is a cool new thing that's coming. It's a way for you to learn, dip a toe in the water without having to, to do too much. And by the way, these look really cool. And if you, you know, have a chance to look at our NFTs, you're going to see, you know, I'm looking at one right now. It's got a chef. It's a chef. He's got a chef coat and he's got a carrot coming out of the pocket. But the leaves on top are the cannabis leaf, right? It's like a little nod to cannabis. And it's a little bit of a, if you're in the club, you if you know, you know, right? It, 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 it's sure. a little bit like, you know, thrice. We changed the E to three because we wanted to sort of make this nod to Web3, like moving into the future. Cannabis is moving into the future. The technology is moving into the future. Um, but we don't want you to have to understand too much about it. We want to make it easy, but we also want to leverage the, the tools. You, we, you know, we don't have to make you go to a Discord server. We can just have a special part of our website that when you connect your wallet, you get access to. And people can understand that and they can say, oh, I can come here and get cool things that other people can't get. Right. And so that's like our first toe in the water. And we want to provide that utility, which is where NFTs are going. If you don't provide utility, nobody cares. Right. right. And so so that's kind of how we're thinking about it. Right. So it seems but like I, you're lowering. I to, can I just add one sure. thing? Of course. Here? Of course. I, I think that there is this. um type of NFT and the type of NFT project that has a template. And that template is build a whitelist, mint your NFTs, drive up the price, open a Discord server, get lots of people in there, you know, run all of these Twitter spaces, blah, 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 figure out what your membership benefits are. And everything is filled with roadblocks and points of friction for people who don't understand how to do it, who don't want to engage, who can't learn because that's not the way that they they learn. They're like late, more later adopters. That's not what we're doing. We're building a membership club to solve the problems that we discussed, right? People want information. They want product recommendations. Brands really want a way to connect with consumers. Web3 and NFTs and this emerging technology just happens to be the perfect vehicle to execute it in because it's where everything is going and also where we have the freedom to be able to do a lot of things that we're not allowed to do sort of in the current state of technology, if that makes any sense. No, of course. Yeah, it's very difficult to market any cannabis product, as you guys mentioned earlier. Um, you know, uh, Facebook and all the social uh, networks, they don't like it for some reason. I don't I don't know why I don't doesn't make any sense. Um, uh, but but that's great. So it sounds like what you guys are really doing is lowering the barrier of entry uh, to the NFT and to the Web3 space. What have been some of your biggest challenges to do that? I think, you know, the, the biggest challenge is 99% of people don't know what an NFT is and don't know what Web3 is or own a wallet or have ETH, right? So that is a big challenge. But when we try to break it down to them and say, hey, we're going to be using some cool new technology, but you can join in the way you're used to e-commerce transaction. And you're going to get this cool thing. Then they're kind of like, oh, all right. Like, I'm willing to learn that much, right? So right. That, that's that been a barrier. Right. Um, I think the, 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 the way we are coming at it, you know, we can't, fortunately for us, there's been this last year where literally hundreds and hundreds of projects have put out great education, right? So we're not going to spend a whole lot of time setting up wallets for people and doing all of that. We're going to focus on the cannabis side, but I think we can do enough initial handholding. And, you, you know, you asked how people join. What we decided is we're going to release our NFTs in batches. And the first batch of 300 we've just released, and you can buy it for, we set the price at 0.05 ETH, 
Right now, that's about $60, $65, right? So, hey, come in and make a $65 transaction and, you know, make it real easy for people. And then we'll release another thousand and the price will be a little higher. So the early adopters get the best, you know, get the best value, which is a model that is tried and true in regular Web2 technology. So we will be able to find the people who are willing to try now And we'll also be able to accommodate people who are waiting a little bit longer rather than trying to put all 10,000 out or some random number, get everyone to do it right now. As Polly said, focus on the price and how much is it worth and all that. Like we're just avoiding all of that. And I think that will really help regular everyday people to coin a phrase, come and join this club. If we say, go to this website, click here. And, and give them some simple options, right? So so the barriers we're trying to not even address are the big barriers that everyone in Web3 is is kind of facing. Yeah, much how uh, AOL uh, ran their business model, right? 100%, you yeah. know? Yeah, without having to mail a CD-ROM to anyone. That's, so that's right, that. that's right. Um, so, so where do you think this Web3 will lead? In general? Yeah. Or, you know, yeah, in general. I think, you know, just like... Everyone was talking about like, is e- no one's ever going to buy clothing online. Like that's the dumbest thing ever. Groceries are not going to happen. Like I think Web3 is, we're not going to talk, like no one talks about Web2, right? Like people don't use that word unless they're talking about Web3. So to me, it is just going to continue to develop. And when there's billions of dollars in gaming and entertainment, and and those kind and and the finan- and forget about whole crypto and just you know financial services in general when there's that much money being poured into a new technology that can affect so many ways that people live their lives every day it's just going to evolve just like e-commerce has evolved just like email has evolved like young people today do not use email like they text they instant chat they do what they do like they're digital natives. They're going to be so used to having a wallet full of NFTs. It's not even going to phase them. Right. So to me, it's just coming and, and it's going to be choppy, just like web two was choppy, just like the internet was choppy. Um, But if we make it easy for people and you don't talk about the technology so much, you know, when I, when I think about Etsy, Etsy was like, hey, you're a, you're a jewelry maker who every Saturday loads up a station wagon and drives to a parking lot in the cold rain to sell your goods. We'll let you do that on the internet really easily. You don't have, you know, no coding, no nothing. You can just upload pictures. It was like, wow, amazing, right? And I and, and people just started doing it. And those were not technical people at all. Right. But they were able to have a 24-7, you know, craft show now. So I think that's what's going to happen in Web3. It's just going to just going to keep coming and pervading various parts of our lives. Nike, Starbucks, Gucci, Balenciaga, you know, Prada. all these big companies, right. pro- everybody diving in. I mean, if Nike's doing it and Gucci's doing it, you know, there's a whole lot of people paying attention. And then forget gaming and, you know, all of that. So... I think it's just going to evolve. But, but, uh, but uh, in, t- in talking about sort of like web one, web two, web three, like who, who really cares to right. listen to this point? Nobody really thinks about that. But the unique aspect of sort of this time and space of web two is that people could, there was this proliferation of engagement and broadcasting and user generated content and things of that nature and web three and where it's going, I think is the evolution you have right now, these very, very early sort of investors, like, I mean, from an investor, marketers, brands, so forth, that are really putting some, some, strategy, some dollars and so forth into building a presence within Web3 and understanding and engaging how to connect with consumers. And fashion brands make sense, right? Because that's how you can represent yourself. But I think the biggest opportunity 
and this is where it's really interesting for us, the biggest opportunity is actual experiences, right? Imagine if this, what we're doing right now, we're all in different places, could actually appear as if we were sitting and, and having a round table and being represented. I think that those experiences are gonna come in the same way that 10 years ago, if you were on T-Mobile and Liz was on Sprint and I was on Verizon, there was an in interoperability issue and we couldn't text each other. And it's crazy to think about that. Right. And all of these people came up with these solutions and then boom, all of a sudden, that tech innovation wasn't necessary because the carrier somehow sorted it out and then texting really became just a, 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 like an overnight thing. And now nobody even talks on the phone anymore. They just text. So I think that that, when you use that sort of metaphor, the, again, I'm going to bring up the pandemic, but I think that people are less interested in engaging in office environments as regularly. People may want to do things a little bit more virtually. And if you could, there's more, not virtual reality, but almost like simulations. And I think those immersive experiences, whether it be a concert or a comedy show or a meeting or, a, you know, any aspect of shopping experience, those will be really interesting. There are a lot of predictions that, you know, the average person will be spending two to three hours a week in these type of immersive experiences. And it's hard to get your arms around but I think we're going to get there much sooner than we got to, you know, massive texting, replacing pretty much everything, talking and, you know, <laughs> engaging in any way possible. Yeah. So. Yeah. So, so um, when do you think um, cannabis legalization will happen federally and how do you think it'll affect your business? Oh, it's going to be on December 28th at 3.30 p.m. Nice. We just I'm going to write know that down. Year. Wait a second. Be, yeah. <laughs> so, you know, I think there's a couple of things. I think for our business, um, I mean, federal legalization would be good for everybody in this industry. Full stop. No doubt about it. Right. You know, the, the make or break of most cannabis companies, however, is not like this one set line in the sand. It's the incremental improvements, more and more states, more and more people voting, hey, why don't we have this in our state? You know, certain things like being able to, you know, cross a state line with a with an agricultural product, like that is going to happen at some point, right? Because we don't grow oranges in 50 states for a reason. There isn't really a reason we need to grow cannabis crops in 50 states either. And so if you know 40 states are legal and it's getting closer to 50 states and people are just things are going to happen on that front that i think we will continue to see incremental improvement um and people want more studies frankly and we can't get all those studies with a lot of the restrictions that are out here so as much as we would all love the legalization to happen if it happens next year or in two years or or what have you the 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 you know the cat's out of the bag and moving forward yeah and you know banking and crossing state lines and things like that i think have more of a shot of getting chipped away at than overnight sort of legalization happening um and for us you know either things are good right like if it's still really hard to get information that's good for us if it's like now fully legal and everybody wants to learn more that's good for us too. So, you know, we're, we're just going to keep pushing regardless um, and still advocating for the industry as a whole to, to kind of get that progress that we're all looking for. Right. Hey, Liz, what, how many states are craft breweries in? I would say there's craft breweries in every state, but that's a different, I think you could grow cannabis for, a craft environment, a destination, come stay at this B&B. &B. And you also have Budweiser, right? It's like distributed throughout the country. So whereas you can grow cannabis in 50 states and you may choose to do that to create certain environments, being forced to do it to supply every level from like really, you know, I'm creating an isolate to go in a very specific drug to, 
here's an outdoor sun grown, full spectrum, wonderful product. We, sh we shouldn't have to do it in every state. We should be able to maximize what makes sense for that state, right? And I, and I think that's how the industry will eventually shake out. There will be craft cannabis everywhere, but there will also be larger brands like General Mills makes a lot of cereal, but, you know, Polly's Breakfast Squares can also exist when she wants to cook them up at her house. Right, right. They're I delicious. Think once, uh, yeah, right, right. I think once the feds... Uh, right, right. Well, once the, um, the feds legalize... I don't think, honestly, that the U.S. producer can will be able to compete with the, uh, let's say, the Colombian producer. You know, it costs you know six hundred to a thousand dollars to grow a pound of weed here in the United States, where it costs about five dollars, you know, or less uh, in a place like Colombia. Uh, I believe that all of this distillate and isolate will be created. Uh, in countries like Colombia and then shipped to the CPG makers, uh, you know, to be added into your toothpaste and your lotion and your Coca-Cola and your all of the other stuff that uh, we consume on a regular basis. And, and then yeah, I mean, I think that's a good the industry is like made it right. Like then we'll know that we've actually gone into the full CPG of cannabis yeah. and that we are going to have, you know, the the high end the middle market things, the very craft and small and big and everything in between, um, that that will be great. Uh, and, you know, the government can can decide on on steel tariffs and cotton tariffs and, and every other kind of thing. And right. cannabis will become, you know, something that goes into that category rather yeah. than a schedule one drug. That's right. Right. And, and that'll be a great day. Yeah, it'll be a commodity. But for sure. like that whole legalization, like it's not like the light is on and off. And I think people talk about it as if it's the Holy grail. Right. Basically it will open up funds to, for research. It will enable safe banking and it will allow interstate commerce. But think about prohibition. And if you really study and look at sort of how states, how alcohol production, distribution brands got built in a post prohibition world, I think it's much, I mean, you still go to places that are dry or dry before certain hours or whatever it is like, oh, why can't I have a Bloody Mary at my brunch? This is crazy town. I know not in Vegas, but, you know, in a, in a lot of places. And I think it will still be like that. And in this early, early stage of the industry, a lot of the states really want to protect the growth and create opportunity within their states, whether they ultimately end up being a craft state or a manufacturing heavy state or a grow heavy state like California, you know, in the same way that wine is. So it's it's a it's always the question that people get asked, but it doesn't change. It's not going to change that much. I mean, it certainly would be amazing for our business because that means more people. I mean, the closer and closer and closer we get to more states, it means more people who are hearing about it, more people who are interested, more people who are looking to try, doesn't necessarily, and learn and understand what products are out there and more products being developed, which means more information and recommendations and help and members for us. So ultimately, you know, it's kind of a win-win. We want legalization because we want all our friends and partners and industry, you know, com com comrades to be successful and for doing business in the cannabis industry to be less challenging, but it's still a very challenging industry. Yes. Yeah, it definitely is. So uh, you've been at this for about a year. You said you launched in uh, January. What, tell me about uh, what the future looks like at Thrice. Yeah, well, sure. we did so, actually. Oh, go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. We, ha we haven't actually launched yet. Ah, okay. Well, we started I mean, a company. We started I mean, the company. Yes. We, yes. Yes. We started the company. We had our vision. We iterated our vision. We developed our membership card. We developed our business strategy. We launched a newsletter. We created some partnerships where we are allowing discount codes and getting people to sign up with us for, via email, but sort of like 
the big lofty goal and the big vision of what we're doing has still just really come to fruition where we haven't technically even launched. We've launched our marketplace, but we haven't actually exposed it or marketed it yet. That is coming very, very soon. But like building a thriving membership is really what is next. Yeah. Awesome. And are you using traditional, uh, you know, marketing methods to to increase membership? I think there's, you know, every every tool in the marketing um, quiver, or whatever, you know, every arrow in the marketing quiver for sure. So certainly, you know, newsletters and Twitter and in and, and all of those kind of web two things going to conferences and being at MJ Biz and speaking about, you know, you were able to come here, Polly, give give a little talk about, you know, there are no state lines in the metaverse. Um, so all of those things, I think partnering with other people in the industry because they have the same goal. They want to get to the consumer and we want to bring them those people. That's going to be a, a super important thing. When, you know, I laugh because when, when in the mid nineties, after I got out of business school, all these business schools were like, now we have to do internet marketing. It's like, no, this is marketing and right. this is a new channel, right? right? Like you've got online, you've got offline, you've got retail stores, you've got malls, you've got, you know, all these different things. And to me, the, the, the new world of web three, we have some new, we can open a telegram channel and talk to a bunch of people, which is, you know, a little bit different or a discord channel, which I hope we never have to do because it's crazy in there. But um, but for me, it's just blocking and tackling of marketing, just like any other business. Um, it really is no different in, in this world. Yeah, I agree. I agree. You got to use everything that you can. So uh, where do we find you guys and how do we stay in touch? And uh, where does the uh, viewer here uh, learn more about you guys? Uh, sure. So, uh, <laughs> so you can find us at thrice.io. That is T H R I C three dot io, and soon we will be launching our membership. So there'll be links to that, but you could sign up for our newsletter there and read about the company and get a little bit more and get in touch with us that way. In terms of all the socials. You can find us at Thrice Official. So same thing, T H R I C three official. And uh, you know, if you want to reach out to me directly or Liz directly, you can find us on LinkedIn. Um, and um, yeah, that's. Did I miss anything, Liz? I don't think so. Um, you know, we're 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 very open to people reaching out, asking questions, want to get in touch. You know, we love talking about any of all of these topics. Um, and, you know, we think that we've got an opportunity to help bridge this gap between knowledge and products and, and the industry. And we, we encourage you to visit thrice once, twice, thrice. That's how you say it. And, um, and, and learn more and pick up an NFT that looks just like you. Yeah. Yeah. Awesome. So uh, don't forget that's thrice with a three at the end instead of an E, just like you see on their T-shirt. I think that's uh, one of the coolest logos I've ever seen. So uh, congrats on that. I think it's uh, it really gets you th uh, thinking. And it's interesting to me that you you started with your three levels of of newsletter and then a day it, it really worked out for the web three to uh, really tie it all together yeah it was uh it's real nice so uh any last parting words anything else you want to add just thanks so much for for having us it's uh it's great to be here and uh we look forward to seeing everyone in the real world and the on and the web three world and in the metaverse awesome awesome do do yes, people call you yeah. yeah do people call you the thrice girls yet Oh, no, but I like that. We... <laughs> well, no, I do not want to be called the thrice girls. <laughs> hey, my, brother, was... my brother refers to my sister and I as girls. Girls. What are you girls doing? Were you girls right. out last night? If, I tried to find you both. <laughs> if we could get the awareness of the Spice Girls, I'll take it. But, yeah, right. Yeah. <laughs> right. All right, ladies. Well, thanks for joining us here. Um, that is uh, thrice.io. Make sure you go check them out. Uh, you know, good education always creates really good legislation. So uh, 
That's what these uh, ladies are all about. Liz and Polly, appreciate you uh, coming on TNM News. And uh, let's stay in touch through your journey. And uh, we'll check back in and uh, see what you're up to, uh, you know, in about six months. Sound cool? Sounds great. Yeah. All right, everybody. She is Liz Wald. She is also Polly Lieberman. I'm Todd Dankin with TNM News. Good night and have a pleasant tomorrow. This is TNM News.